Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction. Uh, we'll start with a new text today, James Joyce's Ulysses. We just finished uh, Mrs. Jalloway by Virginia Woolf and we'll see how this particular novel also corresponds uh, to uh, Mrs. Jalloway in very similar stylistic ways. But before we dive into the text, which we will obviously in due course, we'll spend some time and this lecture will be spent entirely uh, in terms of looking at some of the uh, features of modernist fiction. We've done a fair bit of modernist fiction by now. We've done Heart of Darkness, we've done Elliot Selly Poetry, we've done The Wasteland, we've done uh, you know, the short story by uh, Joyce Araby, and of course we've done Mrs. Jalloway. So I think most of us have a fair idea of how uh, the narrative techniques in high modernist uh, writing uh, operates. But you know, Ulysses being one of the uh, cult works of modernism is one of the most representative texts of modernism. So I think it is worthwhile uh, to spend a little bit of time, uh, maybe a session, which is what we're going to do now, uh, talking about how the entire modernist narrative experiments uh, are constructed and designed. Now, one thing which we find um, is a bit of a recursive feature in modernism or modernist writing, high modernist writing, is the entire technique of stream of consciousness. Uh, what is stream of consciousness? Now, obviously, it means quite literally uh, the way the thought processes work in the mind, right? So, the way thoughts associate uh, you know, one to each other and form an entire chain of associations, uh, which is sometimes logical, sometimes rational, and sometimes uh, affective in quality, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. So some of them, some of the, some of the stream of consciousness technique uh, operates by affective association principles, right? So one thought latches onto another thought as some kind of a chain of effect, and that's how the entire stream of consciousness uh, you know, operates. Now, to put that into writing, that's obviously a very uh, you know, difficult thing. It's a very uh, complex thing because, you know, the entire thought processes, uh, as you know, uh, those of us, uh, I mean, we experience it almost every day. When we think of different things together as some kind of a chain, we find that sometimes there's no causal connect uh, between uh, thought A and thought B. So thought A can end in the middle of, uh, you know, the narrative and then latch itself onto a new thought which might come as a trigger. So you might see something around you which might trigger you. Uh, to think about certain things and then you have a different trigger which takes you a different kind of thought. So in a way it is all connected but at the same time uh, they are not quite causally connected. There is no neat cause and effect relationship uh, between thought processes I and mean, that is how we experience the entire uh, experience of thinking uh, every day. Now modernism is one of the earliest, um, uh, it's probably the first literary movement which really wanted to systematize uh, human thought processes into language, right. So obviously we have had different writings of different eras of time uh, where you know the focus has been on the human mind, the human thought process, the human memory etc. But we find this becomes almost an obsession with modernist writing. This becomes almost a system of writing in modernism where to depict how the human brain thinks, how the human mind thinks becomes uh, and it almost becomes the central theme of modernist writings, right. So sometimes you find that the story gets buried under the thought processes or the entire uh, efflorescence of thought, right. So the fluidity of thought, the flow of thought, the entire um, and the flood of thought processes that becomes a story essentially. So there is no really story to, you know beneath the thought processes and when you come to Ulysses you find uh, that to be a spectacular example of that. I mean there is not a lot of things which happen in Ulysses, it is just about one day in Dublin. Uh, just like Mrs. Talibay was about one day in London uh, and despite that you know we have this one calendar day, one historical day, uh, one stretch of uh, clock time. But you know inside the stretch of clock time, inside a window of clock time, you know, inside, inside that parameter of one the calendar day, we have multiple narratives in operation and sometimes in conflict, sometimes connected to each other to different nodal points. And the nodal points could be characters, uh, so character and uh, narrative A can also be character and narrative B. Uh, the nodal points can also be spaces, uh, so one narrative can intersect another narrative in a certain space and that is why the metropolis is such a fascinating um, example of this kind of, uh, such a handy uh, site uh, for this kind of a uh, narrative technique because the metropolis offers all these different channels of intersection 
Uh, if you think about any metropolis, whether it's London or Dublin or you know, Mumbai or Calcutta or Madras, we find that uh, each metropolis has a different nodal points, different intersections, different places where people come in and intersect and go away uh, to different directions. So those nodal points are very much a spatial entity, a real spatial presence in any metropolis. So the city becomes a very handy site uh, for this kind of a modernist technique of stream of consciousness and hyperlink narratives, because the city offers the actual geographical physical place where nodal points are necessary and where nodal points exist. Uh, so characters in one point, characters in one story can very feasibly uh, connect to characters in another story through different um, you know, sites of intersection. So Ulysses offers such a fascinating example. I mean, it is quite possibly the most uh, famous modernist novel. Uh, it is also quite infamous in its own day. It was banned for a long time in different parts of the world, especially in, America, in the United States of America, where it was uh, banned until the 1960s, I think. Um, the, you know, the two main charges against this novel were, it's quite absurd when you think about it, because the one charge was obscenity, of course. Uh, I mean, that would be a very um, commonplace charge against any book which is banned. Uh, it is supposed to be obscene, you know, it is supposed to be profane, religiously profane, uh, etc. Culturally profane, morally profane. But the other charge was more interesting, that charge was obscurity. Right, so obscurity obviously meant that it was difficult to read the book. It's obscure. I mean, its, it's meaning is not very clear. Now that obviously makes it a bit uh, of a paradox. I mean, if it's obscure, then how do you know it's obscene? Right, so in order to know it's obscene, you must be able to read it. Right, so obscurity would actually undercut the uh, entire claim of obscenity. But this is one of the novels which uh, uh, you know which produces paradoxes like this um, throughout history. And in a joyous at various points, the tool that you know he wanted to put in so many riddles inside Ulysses that the professors across the world would uh, you know struggle to decipher and decode the meanings, right? So that would be like a uh, he's a sort of implanted different jokes uh, in in a, in a narrative in a way which is which would be almost difficult and impossible to decode. Now the obscurity, obscenity paradox in Ulysses it is just a pointer to some of the more important paradoxes in a novel. Because when you start reading the novel, which we will uh, in for the next session, we find that uh, you know this is a novel about one day, as I mentioned. This is a novel about very ordinary people. But as, as the very title suggests, Ulysses is obviously an epic, uh, you know, there's an epic structure, an epic substructure, uh, or a superstructure, whatever you call it, that a novel is very superficially adhering to. So it's also a journey novel, just like the Ulysses, the original Ulysses, Homer's uh, uh, Ulysses was coming back from somewhere. And his wife was having uh, many suitors, his wife was having many visitors, many lovers, uh, and he wasn't aware of it. And he was coming back, and the entire story was about homecoming. Uh, and Telemachus was obviously his son. Uh, so we have a similar kind of a, a structure where yeah, Leopold Bloom is the character, the protagonist in Ulysses, if we can call one person a protagonist. Molly Bloom is uh, his wife. And we have Stephen de Dallas. Uh, those of you who read Portrait of Artists as a Young Man by Joyce would know that that is a novel where he appears for the first time. And he's obviously a more grown man. He's obviously someone who wants to make it big as an artist, as a writer in Dublin. So he becomes the quasi son like figure for Leopold Bloom. I mean, Leopold and Molly Bloom, they don't have any children on their own, biologically speaking. So, you know, uh, Stephen Dallas becomes uh, the quasi son character, the quasi Telemachus character in this novel. And it's interesting how. Uh, the original Ulysses' journey across the mighty seas, uh, across sirens and monsters and different kinds of storms and winds is replicated at a very structural level by you know, uh, Leopold Bloom's uh, travelings across Dublin, the city of Dublin. And obviously there's no comparison to be made at all between the stormy seas of the, Homos, the Homeric uh, Ulysses and the uh, very, very messy and dirty streets and lanes of Dublin that Leopold Bloom inhabits. But that is precisely the point. So this is what uh, uh, Eliot had described as uh, Joyce's mythic method, uh, in the sense that the mythic method is a way, a technique where a certain myth is used, structurally speaking, and then a story uh, sort of seems to conform to that mythical structure. But obviously in a very different setting, obviously with very different characters, with very different sentiments, right? And oftentimes the mythic method may be used to flatten out the certain grand narratives about homecoming, flatten out certain grand narratives about nostalgia, about nation, about love, etc. So mythic method by Ulysses, by, by Joyce or in, in Ulysses, uh, more often than not, it becomes uh, a technique through which the, the grand always character, the original myth is flattened, is deflated. Uh, the significance and mythic significance is deflated 
uh, in this particular novel. Right? So the mythic method is a structural replication uh, of an original mythical uh, journey, of an original mythical action, which is replicated at a very superficial structural level. But beneath these structural superficial uh, adherence, there is very little that is carried over or the, in resonance uh, in terms of sentiments. And the sentiments, if they are similar at all, uh, similar sentiments with the uh, uh, original myth, uh, the sentiments in this um, new text, uh, more often than not, turn out to be more cynical, turn out to be more exhausted, turn out to be more flattened, turn out to be more deflated in quality. Right? So, there is a degree of deflation in mythic method, especially in the way that Joyce uses it. So, one could say uh, that, you know, Ulysses by James Joyce could be seen as a mimicry of the Homeric Odyssey. Uh, it is very shallow mimicry. So, in that sense, it is quite postmodern in quality. And it is one of those novels which is um, uh, obviously is very modernist in quality in terms of stream of consciousness, in terms of the use of space and time, uh, in terms of the interiority. So, everyone is talking about emotions and thoughts and memory and inwardness and interiority in that sense. But also, it is quite um, a postmodern in its centerlessness, or rather in its celebration of centerlessness. So, it does not really mourn centerlessness, it actually celebrates centerlessness. And if we come to a later work by Joyce, which is Finnegan's Wake, we find that it is entirely postmodernist in quality, in the sense it is entirely anarchic, it becomes a text of bliss, uh, as Rollabout would call it, a writerly text, a text which is open for interpretations, a text which uh, you know, which cannot be read as a reader, uh, which, which cannot be consumed as a reader, which, which can also be participated in as a writer, right. That is the distinction that uh, Rollabout has made between the readerly text and the writerly text. The readerly text is something which you can read as a reader, uh, it is got a close quality, hence it is readerly in quality, uh, it is called readerly in that sense. A writerly text on the other hand is something which you can only participate as a co-writer, something that you can be, uh, you know, be an active uh, creator, a co-creator. Uh, even when you are reading it. Now, Finnegan's Wake is entirely that. Now, Ulysses shows signs of such postmodern uh, ex experimentation on language. Uh, we have entire passages which are completely onomatopoeic in quality, uh, just sounds, uh, different sounds put together without any meaning uh, whatsoever. But what those passages uh, do in a very interesting sense is that it gives Ulysses a sense of immediacy. So, it becomes very automatic in some sense, it becomes very immediate in some sense and it becomes a very immediate capture of reality. So, the different sections in the novel where we have tram cars coming in and going. So, the tram cars of Dublin uh, coming in screeching in and going and instead of describing the tram cars, we have sections which just mention the sounds of tram cars, screeching sounds of tram cars, halting sounds of tram cars, uh, the ugly sounds of tram cars, the sonorous sounds of some tram cars, right. So, that obviously gives a more authentic depiction of tram cars movements in Dublin. So, in that sense it becomes very automatic text, it becomes a very uh, immediate text, it becomes a very immediate capture of reality, a capture of consciousness so to speak, which is the other point that I wanted to come to, the whole idea of consciousness. So, how is consciousness uh, represented in Ulysses? And obviously, consciousness is a very uh, fluid phenomenon, it is not really a static or monolithic concept, it is not something which is passively consuming reality around it. Uh, consciousness on the other hand in Dublin and uh, in, in Joyce's Ulysses is very much an active process, it is a process of becoming, unbecoming and rebecoming. It is a very fluid phenomenon uh, consciousness uh, rather than a static category uh, which has uh, just some investments in meaning. So, we find the different characters in Ulysses, you know, whether it is Lupa Bloom or Molly Bloom or Stephen Dedalus, so different other characters who come and go, the minor characters, the major characters and of course, Dublin itself becomes a character, the city itself becomes a very important character, very significant character uh, in this novel as it was in the case of Araby, which is also to be read from Dubliners. We find that each of these characters, uh, they are, uh, they always foreground their consciousness, they always foreground their thought processes, right and thought processes become very, very important in that sense. because. It is not so much about the action, it is not so much about moving from point A to point B, it is about the interiority of movements, it is about the entire depth, the, the, the additional dimension, the third dimension in movement rather than just a lateral dimension from point A to point B. So, in that sense, Ulysses is not really a novel about action, it is a novel about different kinds of thought processes which in turn becomes action. So, in a sense, it is like a uh, it is like an x ray uh, of human consciousness where it basically foregrounds what is supposed to be inside, right? The inside being the interiority of the human mind, the interiority of the human consciousness, the interiority of the human memory processes. Uh, all those processes, all those methods are now uh, externalized in Ulysses, and that becomes the character, that becomes the landscape, the tabula rasa of the novel, so to speak. So, 
uh, there are two different landscapes that play with each other. There's Dublin, there's a real landscape, the real geographical landscape in Ulysses. There's also the different minds of the characters which form a landscape because they are constantly foregrounded in a way that becomes very, very external and exterior uh, So, you know, this entire externalization of interiority is something which uh, makes the uh, landscape very, very mental in quality, very psychological in quality, right? So, you might say it's a mindscape. So, the mindscape of the different characters, which is a string, uh, a stream as well as a string of consciousness, uh, is a very close correspondence to the landscape of Dublin, the very dingy, messy, mutable uh, landscape of Dublin. And that brings us to the other point of mutability in the story. We find that this is a story about uh, changes happening all the time, uh, changes in uh, thought processes, changes in memory, uh, changes in sentiments, changes in bodily functions. We have lots of bodily functions uh, in Ulysses. Uh, there's a lot of defecation happening in Ulysses. We have Lupa Bloom uh, defecating in the very beginning of the novel. Uh, there's a, a lot of description of digestion, indigestion, consumption of food and of course defecation. So, it becomes and this is part of the scandal that it generated in that point in time in a sense it foregrounded the uh, internal bodily function. It, it was not trying to sublimate the body into a romantic uh, category. It was trying to give a very earthly description of the body. The body as a very earthly uh, activity, the body as activity, the body as a fluid phenomenon. Again like consciousness, a very fluid phenomenon, something which uh, you know consumes, digests and you know, has indigestion, something which uh, you, know, you know defecates. So, all these become, all these activities become very much part of the central story of Ulysses, the different bodily functions, uh, you know which was as I mentioned part of the scandal of Ulysses as well. So, the human body in Ulysses becomes a, a, a very much a volatile phenomenon, uh, a mutable phenomenon like the mutable metropolis. So, you find the human figures, the human body, the human uh, activities, uh, carnal activities, you know, uh, consumption activities, all this become part of the landscape as well, all this becomes part of the story as well. So, in that sense Ulysses becomes very much a, a mutable, volatile, uh, you know, velocity driven uh, narrative about human memory, consciousness and, uh, and thought processes in a very, very messy and mutable Dublin. So, in that sense it becomes a very city story, a city which also becomes a character, characters which also become the city. So, in that sense space and human mind are blend into each other in very, very uh, complex and cognitive and organic ways in Ulysses. Which brings us to the other point of organicity. So, as I just mentioned a lot of organic movements happen in Ulysses including uh, sexual movements, digestive movements, defecation movements and uh, consuming movements etcetera. Uh, but all these movements obviously uh, they are normally uh, classified as body movements B A W D Y. Uh, carnal, you know, something which is uh, related to sexuality, consumption, uh, something related to the eating, defecation, something related to the, uh, you know, uh, very, very dirty, filthy bodily functions. Now, you find all these different movements uh, are connected in a way which makes the entire uh, landscape of Ulysses very, very mutable in quality, as I just mentioned. And mutability is a very, very constant phenomenon of the metropolis. And that obviously makes it very, very organic, which is a fun point that I am trying to stress away here. So, the organicity of the city and the organicity of the human movements are blended into each other in, in Ulysses to create this almost carnivalous landscape of organs, of organic activities, organic waste. And waste is obviously a very important function in Ulysses. We have a lot of litter in Ulysses, a lot of waste products, human waste, organic waste. Uh, so, we have a lot of uh, food wasted, uh, human bodily waste of course, which comes from defecation, uh, litter uh, in terms of using paper which is stale, using paper to do certain uh, very, very you know, uh, earthly, bodily, disgusting, filthy functions etcetera. So, filth and defecation and waste and trash. So, all these come together, all these are foregrounded constantly in Ulysses. Now, you find that this is obviously a big scandal given the time in which this was written. Uh, this is a very Catholic Dublin, a uh, very conservatively Catholic Dublin and obviously uh, the religious hold on Dublin is still quite strong. There is a lot of sexual morality at play, a lot of uh, religious morality at play and we found that how uh, that obviously created confusion in the minds of characters and the minds of people who inhabited the landscape as we saw in for instance in uh, Araby the short story where the boy who is obviously having a lot of erotic impulses, a lot of sexual impulses to his manga and sister, but he cannot articulate it, he cannot bring himself to talk about it, he cannot bring himself to acknowledge it. Uh, so, he wants to sublimate it into some kind of religious rhetoric of diversion and platonic worshipping which obviously is not the case. But when it comes to Ulysses we find that 
uh, you know, all these bodily, carnal, sexual, volatile functions are foregrounded in a way which becomes very, very um, quote unquote immoral in quality, right? So that completely undercuts uh, any restrictions uh, which is impairs my morality, religious morality, sexual morality, you know, Catholic morality. So all these are done away with entirely in Ulysses. And as a result, what we have is a very carnivalesque uh, quality of human bodily functions, organic functions, organicity, immediacy, automatism. So all these become very importantly a very complexly blended to each other. So the tram cars, the movement of tram cars uh, blend with the movements of the human body, uh, the rhythms of the city blend with the rhythms of the human sexual impulses. So all these different blending ends happen at different points of time in Ulysses, which makes it such an organic novel, such an organically volatile and automatic and available and earthly and tangible novel in that sense. As a result of which we find it so relevant even today because it talks about certain things that are universal in quality, right? It talks about emotions, it talks about sentiments, it talks about you know, bodily desires, it talks about bodily uh, you know, needs in that sense, uh, you know, and all these are put together in a very realist way. Uh, so in that sense, Ulysses, despite using stream of consciousness, despite using uh, you know, certain very experimental narrative techniques, is actually very, very grounded in reality. Now, which brings me to the final point of today with which I'll come to an end uh, in this lecture. Whenever we talk about uh, realism, we have this assumption of realism being realistic. But of course, nothing can be further from the truth because realism is a narrative device uh, which, uh, you know, which entails, uh, which presupposes an omniscient narrator, a narrator which knows everything, a narrator who has a, a control of the entire characters, entire action of the novel, and a narrator who's telling you a very close narrative in a sense of being, having this absolute knowledge what's happening in the characters' minds, what's happening with the characters' lives, what's happening in the before, now and after. So the omniscient narrator in a realist novel, in realism driven novel, it has complete control, complete cognitive control uh, over the temporality and the spatiality of the narrative in terms of knowing exactly what's happening in a spatial sequence, in terms of knowing exactly what's happening in a temporal sequence. But of course we know that nothing can be further from the truth when it comes to real life. Because real life obviously is not predictable. Real life obviously we don't have any control in terms of space and time. Space and time are always changing in real life and we have you know, the, the entire beauty and complexity and tragedy of real life is this unpredictability uh, in that sense. So in that sense, the stream of consciousness technique or the technique that Joyce uses in Ulysses is entirely unpredictable. It actually foregrounds the unpredictability, the mutability of human mind, the mutability of human life and in that sense it's actually more real way more real than any realism driven narrative technique. And that is the one point that I wanted to so foreground today in a sense of you know undercutting some of the myths about realism. There's nothing real about realism at all. Realism is an artificial narrative technique which presupposes an omniscient narrator who has complete control and complete knowledge over the time, space, before and after of the entire activities and the entire minds of all the characters in the novel. In other words, a realist narrator, a realism driven narrator is basically a god. It, it presupposes a godlike presence, a godly and godlike presence over the narrative. Ulysses in that sense is a godless novel because there's no control over the space and time. The human beings move in very mutable combinations, very complex combinations, very random combinations. They crisscross each other at different points of time. They have bodily needs, they have sexual needs, they have carnal needs, they have different kinds of appetites and all these appetites are foregrounded in a way which makes it very, very real in the sense of being bodily and automatic and lift. So in that sense, Ulysses is about experientiality. Uh, it foregrounds and celebrates experientiality in a sense of being you know, hu human experiences and the way it is uh, experienced, uh, the unpredictability of experience, uh, the mutability of experience, uh, the embodied quality of experience is what is uh, celebrated in a foreground over and over Ulysses. And so that's the premise, that's the stylistic, thematic uh, and narrative premise of Ulysses which I want to talk a little bit about today. And for the next class, we'll dive into the text. Obviously, we can't read it in its entirety for practical purposes. We will certain, uh, we'll select certain passages from the text which we'll highlight and study uh, in some details in due course of time. So we'll start with the text for the next lecture. Uh, we end this lecture today, hopefully having given you uh, some background of the narrative technique, some background of the culture, the conditions, some background of the literary traditions which informed this great novel by James Joyce. Thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.